Hello, grade 12s. Today we will look at a chapter called Differential Calculus. Now in this lesson, our focus is to introduce you to the history and applications of calculus. Calculus is used in many fields of study like economics, biology, astronomy, and engineering. Economists use calculus to determine the right time to buy or sell an item by determining on the marginal value of an item. Biologists use it to determine the growth rate of bacteria. In astronomy, calculus determines the changing speed of objects in space. But it is in engineering where calculus is used most often. Designing and building bridges, roads, tunnels, and curved or domed stacked surfaces are just some of the fields where calculus is used. Let us now join Donovan and MacGyver who will take us through the history of calculus. To start out, let me tell you how two authors, Neil and Sheward, describe calculus. These authors say that calculus was invented to describe situations in the real world. It was invented, they say, as a tool for mathematical modeling, a topic we dealt with in another series. What is interesting here is to notice that calculus was invented by mathematicians. Most well known of these being Newton and Leibniz to solve a problem that they had. Put more simply, calculus was invented to calculate something that mathematicians were not able to work out without it. They invented it to solve particular types of problems. That all sounds a bit strange. Are you telling me that mathematicians had a problem that they couldn't find a solution to with what they already knew and then invented some mathematics so that they could solve their problem? You're quite right. That must have been a really complicated problem. If you don't mind me asking, what was the problem? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. Here's a graph. Oh, okay. It looks like a pretty standard parabola. And it is. Now, the problem that mathematicians faced was how to determine the area under the curve. And why would they want to know that? We're not going to worry about that too much for now. The most important fact is that they wanted to do so. Mathematicians are strange, but okay. So they wanted to find the area under the curve. So what was so difficult? I'm sure there must have been a formula they could have used. Well, that is where things get interesting. There wasn't a formula, and so they had to invent one. And this is how they did it. They started out by drawing a shape underneath the curve for which they could calculate the area. That looks like a rectangle. And the area of a rectangle is length times breadth, but the area of the rectangle is much less than the area under the curve. Quite right. So the mathematician said, what about using a number of rectangles like this? I suppose we can calculate the total area of the rectangles, and then that would be closer to the area we are looking for, but it's still quite far off. I mean, look at all the space under the curve. Well, how about if we divide the area into still more rectangles? The calculation is still easy, and I suppose the estimate is better, though there's still a lot of space left over. True, but what mathematicians realized was that the more rectangles they used, the better the sum of the area of the rectangles would approximate the area under the curve. Let me show you. As you watch, I want you to notice what happens to the amount of space that is left over or unaccounted for. So, what did you notice? Well, the more rectangles there are, the less space is left over. Very good. You're quite right. As the number of rectangles increases, so the amount of space which is unaccounted for decreases, and the sum of the areas of all those rectangles becomes a better and better approximation of the area under the curve. I didn't really think about the area under the curve, but it makes sense that the less space left over and the more rectangles we use, the closer our approximation will be. And that is the idea at the heart of one branch of calculus called integral calculus. 
Integral calculus provides a technique for determining the areas under the curves and the volumes of solids. What the mathematicians realized was that the greater the number of rectangles they used to approximate the area, the more accurately the approximation would represent the actual area. I have a feeling that you haven't told me about the whole story. And what is this about one branch of calculus? Is there another one? You've cut me out. You're absolutely right. I haven't told you what the whole story is. The study of integral calculus is the study of how we get from the idea of many rectangles to a rule or formula for finding the area. And that sounds like a lot of work. You better believe it. Luckily for you, at school we don't study integral calculus. We study the other branch of the subject. It's called differential calculus. Differential calculus also deals with the challenge of calculating something for which there's no formula. Rather than starting with a description of differential calculus, I'd like us to start with a problem. What kind of problem? A problem like the one the mathematicians had and could not solve, but invented a method to solve it. Sounds interesting. Absolutely. And over the next few lessons, I'd like us to go on a journey that the mathematicians took. I'm ready. Good. Then here's a problem for you. Given a piece of square cardboard 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, cut out a square from each corner and fold the remaining cardboard up to make a box with the greatest possible volume. Do you understand what the problem is asking you to do? I should cut a square from each corner of the piece of cardboard like this. Then fold up the sides like this. And if I stick it together, I will get a box. Well done. That looks pretty neat. Now what? Now the biggest challenge is to make the box with the greatest possible volume. And how are you going to go about doing that? I guess I should start by working out the volume of this box. The volume is given by the formula length times breadth times perpendicular height. The dimensions are 16 centimeters by 16 centimeters by 2 centimeters, which gives me volume equals 16 times 16 times 2, which equals 512 centimeters cubed. Very good. Now let me ask you something. Do you think that this is the box with the largest possible volume we could get from, say, a piece of cardboard this size? Well, honestly, I don't have any idea yet. But I guess there's just one way to find out. Really? How is that? Well, I could make a whole lot of boxes changing the sizes of the square that I cut out from each corner. And then I can work out the volume of each one. Off you go then. Okay, I think that should be enough boxes to give us a few options. Why don't you arrange them from one with the smallest volume to the one with the largest volume? Good idea. Then I can see which one has the biggest volume. Well, it looks like this box with a volume of 588 centimeters cubed is the biggest box we have made. Sure, but is that the largest box that can be made? I guess, I don't know that for sure. All I know is that this is the biggest box we have made. So how are we going to be sure? I suppose we could make more boxes, but I really do not feel like making any more boxes. Isn't there a smarter way of working this out? Now you're talking like a mathematician. Do you have any ideas? Well, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. So what if you try to draw a graph of our problem? I like the way you think. That's a great idea. Let's do it together. What should we use each axis for? Well, I think the vertical axis 
being the dependent variable axis, should represent the volume because the volume depends on the amount we cut off the corner. Okay, and what about the horizontal axis? Well, since the volume of the box depends on how much we cut off from the corner, let's use the horizontal axis for the length of the cutout. Fine. We say that the volume is a function of the length of the cutout piece. Great, so what's next? We need some values, and I have one very obvious one. When the length of the cutout is zero, in other words, we don't cut out any corners, there are no sides to fold up, and so the volume of the box would be zero. Great, great. Let me plot that. Well, there's another obvious value when I cut out 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter from each corner. There's no cardboard left with which to make a box again. The volume of the box would be zero. Great, let me plot that as well. Now, what do you think we should do? Mm, I'm not quite sure. In most of the graphs that we have worked with in grades 10 and 11, we got this sort of symmetrical picture which suggests that the greatest volume probably lies halfway between the two zeros, which is when we cut out a square 5 cm by 5 cm. Mm, I'm not quite sure. Do you agree that the maximum value occurs when we cut out a square 5 cm by 5 cm? Magava, why don't you check that by looking at the boxes you made? I'm sure there is one with a 5 by 5 square cut from each corner of the original cardboard. Something isn't quite right. This is the box we made by cutting out a corner 5 cm times 5 cm. It has a volume of 500 cm cubed. But that doesn't make sense because here are at least three boxes with a greater volume. This one has a volume of 512 centimeters cubed. This one, a volume of 576 centimeters cubed. And this one, a volume of 588 centimeters cubed. Have we made a mistake somewhere? MacGyver is looking a little confused. Join us in the next lesson where we will discuss this question in more detail. Thank you for joining us, Grade 12s. We hope that you enjoyed the interesting facts about calculus, its uses, and history. Remember to try the task video at the end of this series and to look at our website for more resources. Goodbye.